If you yes. can remain seated, I'm going to preach sermon number one here just for you. I'm going to preach twice today. Here goes sermon number one for you, okay? And, a, um, and you're like, oh, Lord, he's bringing out the pulpit. He really is going to preach two sermons. Yeah, I really am going to preach two sermons. Um, in a culture that is so confused about so many things, I think sometimes if we're not careful, we don't talk about important things in the body of Christ because we're afraid of how the culture will respond. So today I'm going to preach two sermons, both of them a little shorter than normal, so it's okay. Two sermons that are completely counter-cultural, okay? Um, why join a church and give them money every week? Studies say that the top reasons for people not wanting to join a church is because, number one, they don't trust the leadership, and number two, they don't want to give the church money. So, let me say this really quickly. Two leaders, leaders in the room. I don't care what you lead. I don't care if it's, it's a a small group or a, or a ministry here. To the leaders in the room, let me say this. You can't go to their level of righteousness. The people that you surround yourself will say to you, it's okay to do this. Come make a joke about this. Come laugh about this. Come be a part of this. And if you're not careful, you will go to their level of righteousness and then you will walk out of the room and they will say, there's no way I could follow a leader like that. I can't believe they would joke about that or that they would have conversations about that. So to the leaders in the room, understand one of the biggest hurdles that we're crossing as a, as a culture is that people don't trust us. Don't go to their level of righteousness, okay? To those of you who are struggling with this part of the service, giving, let me talk to you just for a second. The concept of tithing started in Genesis 4, Genesis 14, you see it again, Genesis 26, Genesis 28. It's a concept of tithing out of a manner of thankfulness to God. They just gave 10% of their income to the Lord or of their increase to the Lord. In Numbers 18, 21, the Lord gives Moses this command on tithing and says that it is for all of God's people. Now, it's funny to me in the church world, we latch on to the promises that were given to Israel, but we struggle with the commands that were given to Israel. Okay, we want their promises. We want, we want to be a part of the adopted ones that get their blessings. May his favor be upon you to a thousand generations. That was a promise to Israel. We sing that song as blessings over our life and favor over our life. And then we see moments like this where the Lord commands his people to operate in a certain way. And we say, nah, that's not for me. So he tells them to bring 10% of their increase or their income to the Levites or to the temple keepers. Or to us today, it would be ultimately the leaders of the church. And then the leaders of the church would then take 10% of that income and they would then use that 10% to give in other places as well, which is what we do here. The concept of tithing in Leviticus 27.30, it says, every tithe of the land. Now, I'm a, I'm a really big scripture theologian, and so when words like every are said, I, I kind of study them, and I'm like, wonder what every meant. And here's the really cool thing. It means every. All of them. I, every, every one of them. All of them. Every tithe of the land, every increase of the land, whether it the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's, and it's holy to the Lord. It's set apart for the Lord. So according to Scripture, 10% of what you have increased into your life belongs to the Lord, and it is holy to the Lord. So then whenever somebody gets up here at this moment in service and they say, Malachi 3, it's always the go-to, you know, scripture, Malachi 3 and 8, will a man rob from God? And you say, how have I robbed from God? And you've robbed from me with your tithes and offering. What the Lord is saying there is literally, this is set apart wholly from me, and you're not giving it to me, so you're actually robbing from me. You, 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 you're taking it from the Lord. Why is that robbery? Because he said it was his already. And so I don't care, listen to me, those of you joining us online, I don't know what camera I'm looking into, so I'll just look into the, there you go, I see the red light. 
Listen to me, those of you who are joining us online, I don't care if you attend the house church of five. In that house church of five, you should still tithe to that house, and that house should use the income that you're tithing to expand the kingdom of God. I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me what size the church you go to, where you go. I just trust the word of God, and I trust this concept of tithing. So here goes where we are in today's culture. Everybody understands that we're here. Here goes where we go. People say this is the common teaching of today's culture that doesn't want to tithe. They say Jesus came to abolish the law, so tithing is now no longer required. And I would say to you, Jesus came to fulfill the law. In fact, his exact words were, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law to show you how to live it out. And so Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin You've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Here in this moment, Jesus condemns the Pharisees for their commitment to one part of the law and missing what he called the weightier matters of justice and mercy and faithfulness. And then he says, you ought to do one and the other. The word ought to literally in the Greek is translated that it indicates a need or a necessity to do those things. You could literally translate this scripture, you must do these things and not neglect those things. So when people say things like, you'll hear this, You'll go, to, you'll go to work on Monday and your friend will watch this service and they'll say, I saw you preach, you're talking about tithe, all church wants your money. I, I, I know, I get it, I understand. Jesus never talked about tithing. Yes, he literally did. He literally said, you ought to continue tithing, but don't miss out on opportunities to help being just and ju merciful and, and faithful and, and helping other people. Don't miss out on these opportunities, but continue doing these things. Orders acknowledged. Post and orders remain the same, right? Because our post and orders remain the same, Paul says this, 1 Corinthians, I'll paraphrase it, concerning the collection of the, state, of the saints on Sundays, set aside a portion of your income according to how much you make, so that there is no needs inside of the ministry. Post and orders remain the same. And you're here today thinking, there's no way I can give 10% of my income to the church. And I would say to you, I totally get it. To totally get it. Don't feel bad. Only 5%, this is a Barna study, only 5% of churchgoers tithe. 5%. 1.5 million people out of 247 million U.S. citizens that identify themselves as, as Christians, tithe. That's 0.6%. That's less than 1% of people who call themselves Christians actually tithe. This isn't a trick to try to get in your pocketbook. This is an understanding of this moment matters. This is a, hey, Christians, let me wave a big yellow caution flag in front of you. Isn't it amazing that the enemy has convinced the world that all we want is your money, and we're looking at moments like this, and we say, I ain't giving church my money, and then you go out and throw money to everything that the enemy is offering you. Well, all church wants is my money. All Hollywood wants from you is your money, and you still throwing money at them? All your bank wants from you is your money. All your, everybody wants your money. At least understand that what's being sown into this house is being used to expand the kingdom of God. What's being sown into Hollywood is being used to destroy our children. Get out of my face with that junk. 
Church only wants my money and wheat. The enemy's fishing in that pond over and over and over again. And we as believers are eating it up hook, line, and sinker. This is delicious. We are claiming some sort of moral high ground of why you are withholding your money from the church. Well, I saw a church down the road over in this area, and, and they, they manipulated their funds, so I'm going to hold my church. Look at me, God, being holy with your money. And the Lord's like, you idiot. You. I didn't say that. That was the Lord saying that. I'm not speaking for the Lord. I'm just assuming that's what he would have said. Claiming some sort of moral high ground, all while the enemy is sitting back and laughing at us as we are throwing crazy, stupid money at everything that he's offering you. So, this moment matters. What we do here in this moment matters. Listen to me, younger generation coming up. A lot of people try to get in your ear and they'll try to tell you a lot of things and they'll try to manipulate what's happening here in this moment. And it doesn't matter to me what the Word of God, what does the Word of God say? I'm going to say this, and I don't even, I'm talking to people watching online. I don't even mean this house. We do our best to be a good steward of what comes into this house. We try our best to be the best stewards possible. But I don't care if you give to a ministry that the pastor's a a conniving, stealing, nasty man and manipulating you for all of your money, your responsibility isn't him. Your responsibility is you to give like the word of God tells you to. So your moral high ground that you're waving of, well, I just don't trust people, that's what his word says. He can't trust you then. If you can't trust this moment, and then he can't trust you with increase. So, got to start somewhere. I understand you can't tithe now because you've overcommitted yourself prior to having this understanding, and that's okay. I'm not expecting some huge offering today because I'm having this conversation with you. In fact, I'm actually expecting a smaller offering today because I'm not even going to pass the buckets. What I'm hoping here in this moment happens is that a seed is sown into you to where you have to wrestle with these thoughts in your prayer closet or in your ride home today. you got to start somewhere. Start by being generous and purposeful with your giving. Yeah. Well, I, I help homeless people. That's awesome. You should. Yeah. But you ought not neglect this. <laughs> Just wait, second sermon is so much worse. Just wait. Start somewhere. Be generous and purposeful with your giving. Be faithful with your giving. Set up a mark according to your income and budget it in and say, here goes what I'm able to give. If it's 2% now, great. Start at 2%. Just be faithful with that every single week. And then as God brings increase, understand that it's him bringing the increase. And then as you can go to 3%, go to 3%. Don't, don't, increase, don't increase what comes what, what you spend your stuff on. Increase, he's bringing the increase so that you can get to the place to where you can tithe if you'll try him in this. I promise you. Budget it out. And then finally, be cheerful or thankful with your giving. Watch, watch my video I posted yesterday. It's amazing how many people gripe and complain about everything in life. You are so blessed. We were on a Zoom call with um, Bryson Grizzle Thursday, Wednesday, someday last week. I don't know. He said there's age 9 to 14 girls in this. There's a million people in this slum that's next to them. Ages 9 to 14, 20,000 babies were born to girls ages 9 to 14. Because they live on a dollar. And they sell themselves to be able to provide for themselves. Yeah. Can you stand with me? You have reason to be thankful. There's not one of you in here today 
that are going hungry. And if you are, come see me after church and you won't go hungry. There's not, there's not one of you in here today who, who have to sell yourself to be able to eat. Not one of you. If we're not careful, our heart is moved with compassion towards those things and we forget about our baseline, which is tithing. I just be 100% real and honest here in this moment. I don't care if you don't like this church and don't believe in this church and the future of this church, don't tithe here. But go find a church that you like and that you believe in their future and then tithe there. It's it's not whether or not you should tithe. It's not not up for debate. So God, here in this moment, we're going to dive back into worship. And I pray that what I've said here this morning sows seed into your people. And I pray that our lives walk away from this moment better because of this moment. Enemy, I I bind up every lie that you've spoken over our lives, over our church, over our families about money. I bind it up. Enemy, I say loose this grip of poverty that you have on our mindsets inside of the church. Loose it right now. And allow us to walk in the scriptural favor of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's buckets around. If you're prepared now, you're welcome to give. There's buckets across the front. There's buckets in the balcony. There's a text to give number. You text the word give. This is how I tithe every single week right here. Text the word give. You alone are worthy. What, what did we talk about last week? So, so I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a all over the house can we just throw up our hands I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is your hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much So often we come into times like this where there's so many things happening in our life and in our world that take our attention off of you. We can't come in here so often with elaborate prayers and maybe we don't even have much of a worship to give you, but God, here in this moment, we just say hallelujah, hallelujah. You are worthy of all of the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor. So God, here in this moment, we just say hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Before you seated, look at somebody and say, didn't he already preach?
Will you let him preach one more time? All right. Thank you. I am preached so much this morning, I'm parched. All right, here we go. Countercultural concept number two, okay? This is the series, it's ending today because next Sunday's Palm Sunday, but the series that we've been doing is um, Orders Acknowledge. It's, it's the concept from the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier where one officer will pass on his orders to the relieving officer and he will say, Post and orders remain the same. Been this way since 1948, to which the relieving officer will say, Orders Acknowledged. And so we've talked about repentance. Post and orders remain the same. We've talked about rejoicing and suffering. We've talked about heaven. And when the world is falling apart, look up, your redemption draws near. Week four, we talked about this would be a house of prayer. Then we talked about feed my sheep. And last week, we talked about the authority that we have over devils and diseases. And this week, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn with me to Luke 14. Luke 14, it is a story of a great feast. Luke 14, Luke 14, 15 talks about that blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God, okay? This is not an actual feast. This is an understanding of something spiritual here, okay? So as we're talking through this, understand there is no actual food involved inside of this parable, okay? This concept, this parable has dual meanings, there is an, this is a, a dual meaning of heaven that he's going to be talking through here, but also a dual meaning of the local earthly body of Christ, the church, that Jesus just mentioned a couple of chapters earlier, the ecclesia. Luke 14, starting at verse 16, Jesus gives this parable. And he says, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But as they go out in one accord, people start making excuses. And the first said, I bought a piece of ground. I must go see it. Can I be excused? The other said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them all. And can I be excused? And another said, I've married. I got a wife. I cannot come. Can I be excused? Just hold your finger there. We're going to continue through this portion of Scripture. Jesus, or a, a, a master, throws this great feast. And he asks people to come be a part of this great feast that he's throwing, and yet everybody has excuses of why they can't be a part of this feast. It's amazing the three that he picks out here are things like, I'm busy, I got to work, and I got family issues. <laughs> It's amazing that your three excuses that you use today are, I'm busy, I got to work, and I got family issues, right? Right? Every one of us have an excuse of why we can't do the things that, that the Lord has called us to do. And every time I talk about excuses, this, this concept gets me in trouble. So as you get frustrated at me or as you're getting ready to get frustrated at me or you're already frustrated at me from the first conversation, just know um, it's, it's okay. Um, there's a wise man that was once quoted. I think we have a, a picture of him and his quote. A wise man that was once quoted and he said, do or do not, there is no try. You either do it or you don't, right? Well, I'm going to try to live right. I'm going to try to, you know, get healthy. I'm going to try to start coming to church. I'm going to try to, and what happens is when we aren't able to do those things, then we say, well, at least I tried. I thought you were going to get your life right. Well, I tried, right? Do or do not, there is no try. You either want to be at the birthday party or you don't want to be at the birthday party. Not I'm going to try to get there, right? You either want to eat right or you don't want to eat right, right? There is no I'm going to try to eat right. You know, you, you ain't going to eat right. 
You either want to come to prayer or you don't want to come to prayer. You either want to read your Bible or you don't want to read your Bible. You either want to do the things that Scripture's calling us to do or you don't want to do them. There is no try. Now listen to me. I believe that excuses are honestly just priorities revealed. I got an excuse. All you're doing is, is revealing your priorities that you have in your life. Now there's always an exception to everything. So as I go down this path, understand, I know there's actual excuses that are valid for a moment in life. But not whenever you make a declaration that you're going to make a lifestyle change. There is not excuses. that There are excuses that will take you away from that for moments, but not that will take it away from your life, right? So what I mean by that is if you say, hey, Family, we make this bold declaration that every night we're going to eat family dinner together. Every, every Tuesday night we're going to eat family dinner together. And you have this incredible family time the first three Tuesday nights. There are going to come a moment where you have to work late and there's nothing you can do about it and you miss Tuesday night family dinner. That's an excuse that makes sense in the moment. Right? There's not a time, if this is a bold declaration that you're making and this makes sense to your family and this is good and healthy for your family, there's not a time where you should just say, well, we just can't do it anymore. Let's just stop even trying to have Tuesday night dinner. Right? That's what we do. We, met, we, we put our eyes on this, this grand thing and we try to walk towards this grand thing and we say, I'm going to try to get there. And then whenever we can't, we just give up on it and throw the, throw the, throw the baby out with the bathwater, Right? Lifestyle changes that I hear most often are this. Here we go. I need to lose weight. And I, my response to you when you say that is, so do I. Would you like a Reese egg? <laughs> and oftentimes you say yes. We open up a Reese egg. We eat them together. And then we say, we should probably lose some weight. Just, just how it happens, right? I hear things like, I want to fix my marriage, or I want to get out of this burden of debt. I, I want to fix my marriage. I'm going to try to fix my marriage. And what we do is we go in there and we kiss our wife and we apologize to her, and then we expect your marriage to be fixed. Guys, in case you're wondering, that is not fixing your marriage. Some of you are like, What? Are you kidding me? People say, I want to get my life right with the Lord. I want to live better. I want to do better. I want to be a better human. I want to be a better person. These are things that you do. You don't just try to do them. You do them or you don't do them. You're not going to try to be a, a, a Christian. You're either, you either do it or you don't do it, right? You, 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 you're, you can't just pray and say, Lord, I'm sorry, kiss him once, and then walk away and expect everything to be fixed in your life and then get frustrated at him in three weeks when you're like, I prayed once, God didn't fix everything in my life, so now I'm going to go back and live in chaos. That's not how it works. Okay. So they're just coming up with these excuses of why they can't come to this, this supper, this dinner, this feast, right? They just got all of these excuses, and so Luke 14, 21 they come, the servants come, and they report this to the master. And the master of the house is angry. And he says, go out into the city, bring in the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Now hold your finger there just a second. The excuses, this is Jesus telling the story. The excuses of why people aren't being fed make the master angry angry. We have all of the reasons in the world why we aren't able to serve, why we aren't able to give, why we aren't able to join a small group, why we can't read our Bibles, why we can't come to church, and all of your excuses seeming valid in the moment. Nobody would look at this guy who just got married and say, nope, you should still come to the, to the feast. All of the excuses seem valid except for they make the master angry. Wow, can you imagine doing something knowingly that it's going to make the master angry? 
The master wants you at the feast, and he's sick and tired. I'm going to put it in my words. He's sick and tired of all of your excuses. We got all of the reasons in the world why you can't be a part of whatever it is that God's doing. And listen, I already see some of your faces. You're never coming back to church here again because all I've talked about is money. And now I'm telling you that no excuses for you not to be a part of kingdom things. That is totally okay. Whenever you go to whatever church that you're a part of, the same concept is true there. The master is sick and tired of our excuses. He's sick of them. He's angry with them. Why would Jesus put this in the story? Because he knew that you were going to have valid excuses of why you can't serve the Lord and why you can't do things that the kingdom of God is calling us to. And he's just reminding us here that although your excuses seem relevant and valid here in this moment, to him they make him frustrated. Woo! So... The master says, I tell you what, I'm angry. So go into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Now let me just say this. If this isn't real food in the story, then these aren't really disabled people. Okay, this isn't about disabled people. This is is about a, a group of people that seemingly wouldn't be wanted at the feast. And Jesus says, or the master says, Go out and get people that wouldn't be welcomed at the feast and bring them to the feast. Here we go. Let me just pull out my soapbox and stand up on it here just for a moment. It's amazing to me how many people will complain about kids and teenagers serving in Kids Point and they won't serve themselves. It's amazing how many people will complain about leaders in the church and you won't go through the process of becoming a leader in the church. (laughs) Hang in there, it gets worse. It's amazing how many people will complain about things they see happening in the church and won't do anything in their life to set things in motion so that they can affect the change. Instead, they just sit around and gripe and grumble. So what the master does is the master says, okay, all of you church folk that know how to do church, that should be invited to the feast, that all you want to do is sit around and make excuses and gripe and complain, all of you that are going to do that understand that's fine That angers me. You do what you want to do. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the servants into the highways to go pull people in that you don't think are worthy to even be at the feast, and I'm going to pull them in, and I'm going to feed them. What? Church was never meant to be a hotel for saints. It's not what this place is for. You broken, you messed up, you got sin in your life, you got, so does everybody else on your row. We we are all jacked up, messed up, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, we're able to stand here and rejoice in who we are in him. Our job is to get those who are spiritually unwell to the feast. You're sitting here today and thinking, well, I was going to invite this person. There's no way this church would want somebody like that. You're sitting in the balcony today, and you're like, i just here because my friend told me they were going to take me out to dinner today, and I just don't feel welcome here. I just don't, I just don't feel like this is my kind of church because the preacher is weird, and I get it. I get it. <laughs> just got too much sin in my life, man. I just don't feel like this is the kind of place I can fit in. And I would say to you, you're exactly what the church was started for and what the church is looking for so that we can introduce you to a savior that can change your eternity. We're looking for dirty pennies that nobody else wants. You're watching online today and I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, I bet you do want me to come to church because you want me to give or you want my gifts or you want my talents. Listen, 
I, I'm just going to make a really bold statement here. Maybe a lot of other people in your life that want you for your money or for your gifts or for your talent or for your looks, we want you because the Spirit of God is drawing us to you so that we can spiritually get you healthy and well. You may be loaded with money and talent and starving to death spiritually. We remind... Mm -hmm. Y'all know some of them people, huh? Y'all like, oh, stay there, preacher! Loaded with money and talent and starving to death spiritually. You remind me of the guy, I don't know if you watched the show alone. It's awesome. They just throw these people out in like the most terrible places ever. And they're like, good luck. Call us when you quit. I was watching one season and this guy, he's, he's, he's ready, he's set up to win. He has his entire tent that he made out of trees. I don't know. Like he has his entire place filled with fish. He has them smoked. They're ready to last through the winter. And they come ever so often to check their vitals and just to make sure they're not dead. And they come and check on them and they're like, hey, we have to pull you out of the game because you haven't eaten enough. And his whole tent jam full of fish and there's a feast happening inside of the church and i'm trying my best to get you spiritually fed so get here and for some reason you're looking at all the fish around you and thinking i can make it through the winter without having a snack here in this season mm. listen it's not about growing a church not about how big a church is you're you're you say that, I would say you're exactly right. I feel like these servants that were sent out, and the servant comes back to the master. They, the master sends them out. Go get, the, go get the, the spiritually disabled. Go get them and pull them in. And the servant comes back and they say, Master, it is done as you have commanded, and still there is room. Master, we have done everything we can. We've put up billboards, social media blasts. We've encouraged people to invite. We've sent postcards, and still there is room. We've went to hospitals and shelters and schools and firehouses and care facilities, and still there is room. The empty chair beside of you should break your heart, not make you thankful that you don't have to sit next to someone. Hmm. Jesus, Master, there's still room. And we were in a double wide trailer with eight people, and the double wide trailer sat 80. Every time I see an empty chair, I'd say, Master, there's still room. What, what are we to do now? And go to multiple services, and I look inside of any of those multiple services that were not full, and I'd say, Master, there's still room. What do I do now? Now we got this massive sanctuary where there's plenty of room. And I'd say, Master, there's still room. What do we do now? I think sometimes we think, if I were Jesus, here goes what I would say. Master, what now? There's still room. Master, we've been here since middle of December, end of December. Man, it's incredible what you've done here. It's incredible Look around, man. It's incredible. Thank you, Master. Thank you for what you've done here. What do we do now, Master? And if I were the Master, I would say, man, take a break. You guys have worked hard. You've, 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 you've went out. I'm so proud of you. Now sit back and relax. Enjoy the dinner. Don't worry about the empty seat. It's okay. That's what I would say if I were the master. But not, that's not the way the master reacts. What the master says, they come to him and they say, Master, there's still room. So the master says, Go into the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in so that my house may be full. Go get them. 
compel, literally beg them to come be a part of what I am doing in this house, this feast that I am feeding. Go get them, go compel them to come in because there's still empty seats in the house and I want my house full. Post and orders remain the same. Wonder what Jesus would say, the master would say about this house today. Thank you, you're incredible, I'm so proud of you. You know what he'd say? There's still room, now go get them, go get them in here because I want my house full. Do you think Jesus wants this house full? Okay, I, I, I know, I know, I know what happens here in this moment. Oh, you know, here you go, preacher talking about money. Now he just wants more butts in the seat so he can feel good about himself, how packed the house is. I am so sick of people taking everything that a pastor says and warping it to think that he's some sort of arrogant dude. Like, I want the kingdom of God to expand. There are people in your life that are dying and going to hell, and you might not be able to take them to Jesus. Jesus, but if you get them here, we can help you. Why you always want us to invite people to church? Shouldn't we invite them to Jesus? Yes. If you are comfortable enough inviting people to Jesus, absolutely start there. But after you introduce them to Jesus, then the next place you should invite them is to his house. <laughs> truthfully truthfully thank God Easter's coming easy opportunities for you to invite people to church with you your thoughts about this place will determine whether or not you invite people to this place with you right right if you believe that this house is a house of integrity, if you believe that this house is a, ha is a house of spiritual authority, if you believe that this is a house where people are redeemed and lives are changed and sinners saved and people healed, if you believe that this is a house where the Spirit of God is moving and people are delivered and set free. If you believe this is a house where the kingdom of God's agenda is furthered and not Pastor Jamie's, if you believe that this is a house where the name of Jesus Christ is going to be lifted up each and every week whenever you come in here, then I have no clue why you don't want people to be a part of that with you. Yeah, we're kooky, and yeah, we're crazy, and yeah, we scream and do some stupid stuff and lift our hands, and yeah, the music's a little too loud, and yeah, the carpet glue smell from the carpet's making you a little woozy right now. I get it. All of the things that you have reason to complain about, I get it. I get it. But if you truly believe that your friend is dying and going to hell, then you would want to get them to a place to where... If you're not comfortable leading them to Jesus, then you would want to get them to a place to where you know every single week here they're going to have opportunity to find a relationship with him, right? We stand with me? I walk into this place every Sunday morning. People say, why are you so happy all the time? I'm not at all whenever I get into this place though something special about this place not, not this place listen I don't care if you, you watching online I don't care if you attend a church of a hundred if there's empty seats the Lord wants his house full I, I don't care if you attend a church of a of hundred thousand if there's empty seats the Lord wants his house full I don't care if you go to a house church and there's eight seats in your living room and five people that are joining you. The Lord wants your house full. I truly believe that in whatever church or ministry you're a part of. I truly believe that. Truly believe God is calling his church post 
and orders remain the same. He's looking at his people and saying, there's still room, master, what do we do? Go compel them to come in because I want my house full. What happens here is different. What happens here changes lives. What happens here transforms people. There's a peace that flows in this place. There's a hope that flows in this place. There's healing that flows in this place. There is joy that flows in this place, right? Come on, sing that out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. orders remain the same what would Jesus say to this house go get them I want my house full this is so anti-cultural yet it's so scriptural well preacher I don't have to go to church to be a Christian listen I saw a post by Tony Evans this week awesome awesome minister I don't have to be a, a Christian to go to heaven or, or, or a, go to church to be a Christian. You're exactly right. Your salvation is found in Christ alone. But he said this, you also don't have to go home to be married. But you stay away long enough and your marriage will be affected. Yeah. Ooh. Mm, mm, mm. Try it, man, if you want to. Try it. Stay out about three weeks and don't call her, don't let her know where you're at and see how that works out for you. You can have all of the greatest excuses in the world. Could have lost your phone, your truck broke down. It sounded like you in a country song. You can have all of the greatest excuses in the world, but you don't come home for three weeks. The master of the house going to be angry. <laughs> right get to church pull up to the table eat from the feast and then invite others to be a part of what God is doing amen there are there are for you as you are on the way out there are invite cards Easter is coming I don't care if you want 1 12 20 whatever you want it's going to be ushers at every door as you are on the way out. They're going to be offering these to you. You don't have to take any. Don't just take them and then throw them in the trash whenever you pass them. Don't do that, okay? Take some with you and invite somebody to church with you and use this as an opportunity, as a tool to get people here so that ultimately we can help introduce them to the one that can change their eternity. Maybe that's you here today. Maybe you were invited here and you are... You are so weirded out by what's happening here today. Somebody here invited you with the hope that I would here in this moment introduce you to Jesus. So let me do just that. He is the greatest gift you could ever be given. He loved you so much that even while you were a sinner in your most disgusting nastiest day of your life where you didn't want anybody to see you he saw you and loved you so much that he was willing to go to a cross for you in that moment even while you were a sinner he chose to die for you so that you could get to a moment like this understanding that all of us have sinned every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God right so that you could get to a moment like this where if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and according to the word of God, you shall be saved. So I'm going to pray right now with you and for you. I pray that you have the boldness here in this moment to confess that you can't do it on your own, that you need a savior. 
believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is the only one able to save you. And then here in this moment, all of heaven is getting ready to go absolutely bonkers and rejoice for you. Father, I pray right now all over this house that if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, they've never accepted you as Lord of their life, and the person sitting next to them that invited them, they're praying for them here in this moment, praying, God, let them just have this moment with you. I pray, God, that you would here in this moment give them the boldness to confess with their mouth that they need a Savior, believing in their heart that you are the only one able to save them, and then according to your word, they shall be saved. Thank you, Lord. We rejoice with their decision this morning. We celebrate with that, knowing that lives are forever changed here, and there is joy in this house for what you've done inside of them. Amen? Amen. Now, in heaven, what's happening right now, if, 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 you, if you took that step and you, you were a part of that bold journey with me, in heaven right now, they are going absolutely bonkers. According to the word of God, all of heaven is stopped right now and rejoicing and celebrating at you coming back into the fold of you taking that step. Yeah. So... We want to celebrate with you as well. According to the word of God, your next step in this journey is baptism. For you to go down, to make a bold declaration to the rest of the world. Right now you've already made it to the pits of hell. Now you're making it to the rest of the world. And you're saying to the rest of the world that I'm going down in the likeness of his death and coming up in the likeness of his resurrection. So if you're here this morning and you'd like to be baptized, maybe you prayed that prayer and you want to take your next step. We would love to celebrate with you what God has done. We have towels backstage, t-shirts backstage. We are ready for you. You may not be ready for us here in this moment, but we are ready for you. They're going to sing this song through. If you'd like to be baptized, Miss Christie's over here in the corner. Go over and see her and let us celebrate with you the same way heaven is celebrating with you. Come on, sing it out. We say there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Yeah. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out there your is praise. Joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Can, can you imagine the excitement in heaven right now? Can, can you imagine how absolutely crazy heaven is going right now? I, I wish here in this moment we could just worship and celebrate like the angels in heaven are worshiping and celebrating here in this moment. Come on, sing it out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. We won't be quiet. We shout. 
I, as, as they're talking to them backstage and getting them prepped, making sure they understand what they're doing, making sure they're understanding the step that they're taking, I, I just want to say to... A, a generation that trained me up. Let me, let me talk to you just for a second. To a generation that trained me up as I am reading Scripture this past week. If you're reading the Bible through with us this year as we're reading Scripture, we, we see this moment where the reason I named my son Caleb, this moment where Caleb was one of the spies and he goes in and he comes back with Joshua with a good report. And ultimately we get to the place to where Caleb is in his 80s and says, I may be old in body, but my spirit is still strong and I want to continue down the promises that you spoke over me 40 years ago. But let me talk to a generation that raised me up. A generation that taught me and convinced me that there is a great last day outpouring of His Spirit. Let me talk to you for a second. Let me talk to a generation that taught me how to live righteous and how to walk this thing out. Let me talk to you. We need you now in this season more than ever. I'm praying that the Spirit of God right now would reveal to you promises that he spoke over you 20 and 30 and 40 years ago and say to you, let that spirit man inside of you rise up and be strong. Amen? Hi, friend. How are you? Good. All right. Mom and dad, come on up here with us they get a good picture. You testify to this entire congregation that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yeah, hold your nose for me. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we say, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet Oh, we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. His first time here, his first time here was Super Bowl Sunday, right? And then y'all came to the Super Bowl party that night. Before the Super Bowl party, we started talking about baptism, and he said, "Yeah, it's something I'm gonna have to study out and figure out, and I'll see what I want to do about that." The Lord said, let me show you what I'm going to do with you. Here it is. It, hey, and for you, that's okay. If it takes you weeks to take this step, it's okay. If it takes you months to take this step, it's okay. Just know this step is here, ready, and waiting for you at any point, okay? All right, man, you testify. Come on, you got him. You got a good picture. You ready? Recording, making it pretty cheap. You testify to this entire congregation that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yeah, hold your nose for me. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out the praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. What's up, my man? How old are you? Seven years old. 
telling the rest of the world today at seven years old that the Lord Jesus Christ lives in him. How incredible of a bold step is that? All right, you testify to everybody out there. You're gonna tell everybody out there that you know Jesus Christ is your savior, right? He lives in your heart. He saved you from your sins, yeah? All right, hold your nose for me. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your mystery. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your mystery. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. What's up, man? How are you? What's your name? Billy? Billy? Is this your first time here? Yeah. It's Billy's first time here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, Billy, you testify to this entire congregation that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Hold your nose for me. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, and we won't be quiet. Yeah, yeah. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. <laughs> What's your name? Hector. Hector. Is this your first time? Yeah. It's Hector's first time. Father God, I pray for Hector right now. The man of God inside of him that the enemy is trying to off, get him off course. I pray right now, God, that you would stir up inside of him every gift and every talent that you put there. That you allow him to be the man of God that you called him to be. Hector's going to change a lot of people's lives. You believe Hector's going to change a lot of people's lives? It's your brother? You're Vanessa's brother? That's why JP's crying down there? All right, Hector. You testify to this entire congregation that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Hold your nose for me. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's joy in the house of the Lord. Let's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out there is joy. Let's joy in the house of the Lord. Surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. So for those of you this is your first time here, we do this weird little thing here where we just ball up our fist 
and we yell, let's go. And all them people out there are going to be yelling, let's go. Because all of heaven is yelling, let's go. Right? Ready? One, two, three. Let's go. Let's go. What an incredible service that we had today, right? Amen. God is so good. So today, if you didn't get baptized, but you gave your heart to Christ, we would love to hear from you. If you will text this word FREEDOM to 843-353-1600. Also, if this is your first time, Pastor and Maddie would love to meet you right back here in Connect Point, this glass room directly behind the sanctuary. Um, if you have kids, if you'll exit over here to my left, everybody else, if you'll exit straight back. Um, also, um, we have opportunity to give. There's black boxes at every one of these exits. You can text the word GIVE to 843, it, there it is, 882 2066. Um, also, you can give through the app or you can give um, online. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you, God, for this awesome opportunity, God. God, to come into your house, God, to worship you, God, and to hear from your word, God. Father, today I pray, God, for every life that has been in here, every life that has watched online. Father, I pray, God, Lord, that you have blessed them right there where they're at, God. Lord, that you have spoken to their hearts, Father. I pray, God, this week that you would give each and every one of us an opportunity to share you with someone somebody. God, we give you praise and we give you glory for all that you do. In your mighty name we pray. Everybody said, Amen.